For all the U.S. talk about democracy, the trust territory was run entirely out of Washington from the beginning. Secretarial orders issued from the Secretary of Interior were the ultimate law of the land. Since the late 1950s, select Micronesians were convened for annual leadership conferences. There was a committee called the Committee to Advise the High Commissioner, and that committee consisted of two representatives from each of the six districts. So there were quite a few of these prominent Micronesians that were in the advisory committee. And, and then we work out that it would be better to have a council because this advisory was just a group advising the High Commissioner what to do. But a council would be more, more say into what to be done in, in, in these governments. They got very valuable experience talking in English and uh, getting their ideas across. And uh, they would tour around to see what was going on at a locale where they happened to be visiting. So that, that gave them more exposure and gave them new ideas of what, what was possible. In 1961, this body evolved into the Council of Micronesia. The uh, Council was established in 1961. Uh, that's representing uh, all the districts. And uh, our first meeting was on Guam. The group was composed of uh, top notch Micronesian. For the first time, the Micronesians are meeting, are talking about the future. The identification of some real Micronesia white leaders, Dwight Haney especially was really uh, awakening, I think, that there was some possibility that there could be, in fact, a Micronesia white government. Island leaders had spoken to one another and to the expatriate administration about their needs, their desire to have a formal voice in decision-making. But they still had no authority in the government. Finally, in late 1964, one of those orders authorized the establishment of a territorial congress. A great future. At last, Micronesians were to have a genuine legislature, the first step in full self-government. And we went for several days of having a pre-session conference uh, before that first day of meeting, uh, July 12, 1965. And we talk about responsibilities of a representative, uh, including seeing the movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. <laughs> Senate will come to order. Introduction of new bills and joint resolutions. Mr. President. Senator Smith desire to be heard on section 40. I have a bill to propose, sir. You may proceed, Senator. On July 12, 1965, in a chamber that had once been a community club dining room, the Congress of Micronesia met for the first time. So uh, there was some, you know, excitement because new things had uh, never happened before. We marched into this uh, big auditorium in Saipan to get sworn in, wearing our suits. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear that you have been truly elected and properly all office as a member of the House of Delegates of the Congress of Micronesia, that you do freely, willingly, and without reservation accept 
the responsibilities and obligation of this high office that you will discharge these obligation and responsibilities in a manner that will bring honor to this high body and to the people of Micronesia so help you God The authority of the Congress was limited. Its legislation could be vetoed by the High Commissioner, and it had no power to override a veto. But, but we were excited in that we learned that we will finally have the authority to legislate. So this was how Congress of Micronesia started. Uh, there were very few bills that were introduced but many, many resolutions. Congress's power over the purse was limited to locally raised revenue. It could only appropriate the one million or so that was raised through taxes. When I got into the Congress, the first thing that I found out was that, you know, there was that infighting between the administration and the Congress. We were trying to see how much power we have in terms of legislating. And little by little, you know, we were starting to get what we want. You know, they were respecting our wishes, the wishes of the Congress. We were reviewing the whole TT budget by the time I, we got out of there. Political authority was being shared on the district level as well. District councils were being transformed into local congresses. Admittedly with limited power, but some power was better than none. At any rate, all this could be seen as a dress rehearsal for the full self-government that was to follow. Meanwhile, the Congress established a political status commission to examine the future status options that lay open to them. Their job was to look at each of the three options available to us. Integration with the U.S. administration, free association, or complete independence. The first thing they did was to travel throughout the Pacific area and to look at the forms of government that were in, they look at Hawaii, American Samoa, uh, Cook Island, and after all of that, then they came back and they started to say, maybe this is what we want from this area. And the report, unanimous report, uh, rejected out of hand any territorial relationship with the United States and said that we want either free association uh, relationship uh, based on the uh, Cook Islands uh, experiment with New Zealand uh, or independence. In late 1969, Congress took its biggest step forward yet. It opened formal negotiations with the U.S. on the political future of the islands. These negotiations were to last for over a decade and would conclude in the termination of the Trust Territory. <laughs> 